Good, good morning. Uh, I'm Dave Liebman. I'm here to talk to you about uh, deep learning in Clojure, specifically with Apache MXNet. Um, first of all, the goal of this talk, who is this talk for? Um, if you have deployed deep learning frameworks or anything re re related to deep learning, in Clojure or not in Clojure, into production, this is probably going to be a bit remedial. Um, the point of this talk is to give a high-level overview. Not, I'm not going to dive into any of the math or, or specific algorithms. I think, actually, the previous talk probably did a good job of that. Um, my goal is to inspire you to uh, try some of these things out that you can now do and to show you the things that are possible uh, in deep learning with Clojure, um, with this library and with others. Um, first, to get everybody on the same page uh, with the terminology, let's go into a quick example from the uh, field of computer vision so that we can all use these terms without uh, losing anybody. Um, so we have the MNIST data set. This is a classic example from machine, machine learning from computer vision. It's 60,000 or 70,000 uh, handwritten digits, 0 through 9. And the goal, of course, is for the computer to tell you which digit is written. Okay? So we do that by taking the pixel image, 28 by 28, and encoding that as a number of vectors. If you see a mark, then that gets a, a value according to its brightness. And then you, that gives you a square, right? And if you unroll that square, each line getting concatenated with the previous line into one long vector, turn that sideways, and then that's your input. That's the input to your neural network. The, the input layer, just like any other layer, is connected, or each node of, of the input layer is connected to every single node, every single, quote, neuron, in the following layer. So that's the, the large number of connections you see there. Now, the goal of this, so you have the input layer on the left, you have the hidden or middle layer that makes it a deep learning framework, right? If there's no, if there's no middle layer, then it's uh, just a neural network. If, it's, if it has middle layers, then you're doing deep learning. Congratulations. <laughs> and the output layer on the right uh, is equivalent to, or has the number of nodes equivalent to the number of possible outcomes, right? So here it has to be 10, right? You have one node, one quote neuron, uh, according to OK, I, the first one says, I think it's 0. The second one says, I think it's 1. And number 5, OK, it really thinks it's 5. There's a possibility that it's uh, 8. Right? There's some 8-ness in the, the image there, but it's not that confident. So deep learning work means building or designing architectures like this, building them in some sort of high-level language, and then training them. And we can do this in Clojure now using Apache MXNet. So this is a deep learning framework. Oh my goodness, I forgot to explain MXNet itself. MXNet is an open source deep learning framework from the Apache Foundation. It has many different high-level languages uh, that you can work with it in, one of which is Clojure. I'm going to talk about the details of how later. But you can work with it from Clojure. You can design a network like this. This is actually the, that precise network. And you can say something using a, a, you know, a, an elegant library, saying I want a layer that does this, and then uh, make the connections, do this kind of math mathematical operation to the next layer, like this, and blah, blah, blah. You're working with maps. You're working with Clojure. It's very nice. It's very elegant. But sometimes the examples are not so straightforward. They're not so relatively simple. So let's look at an example from natural language processing to get into a more complex example. For instance, say you were implementing this paper from 1999 out of Hochreiter and Schmidhuber's lab uh, in Germany. This was a, a really uh, seminal paper for natural language processing. It, it kicked off a number of other papers uh, playing on the same uh, architecture. Um, and the idea was that if you have a recurrent neural network, which is a, network, a neural network that tries to remember some sort of context from before. So co contrast that with, like, say, a, a Markov chain, which only knows the previous three words. That's not so helpful if you, you're in an article about uh, France, and you, have a, you take a few words to say something about Germany, and you forget that you're talking about France. That's not good. So you want to keep some sort of context from before. And so that's a recurrent neural network. And they introduced the LSTM, the long short-term memory, which is just a more complex way of holding that context in, in your mind, or in the network's mind. And it looks like this. This is every single neuron it has a, an ar internal architecture like this, with gates coming in with values from before, and the current value here, and then melding them together, and then pushing them out in separate values. We're not going to get into how this works, but it is a, a much more complicated architecture than the standard neuron. And there are many, many variations of this. So can you do this in closure? You can. 
we have, th this is a, actually a shipped example, just like the previous one. This comes with MXNet, the, the Clojure MXNet stuff. As an example, you can run this on your machines today. You can do this right now. You can modify it. You can see how it works uh, and whether it performs. Uh, this is a definition not of the entire network, but just of the single node, right? So again, this is a, a good deal more complex than the uh, computer vision example. And again, we're working with maps, we're defining uh, uh, network layers and so on, and it's, it feels like playing in a high-level language. That's good. So what does it do? If at, at every stage, this neural, uh, this, yeah, this neural net will ask itself, or you ask it, what letter probably comes next? That's all you're doing. You're not teaching it words, you're not teaching it anything else, just what letter probably comes next. And if you train a network of these nodes on, for instance, uh, as a shipped example, maybe a one megabyte corpus of Barack Obama speeches, and then you give it a starter sentence, right, something human written that it then tries to riff off of, then you get results like this. And that's not so good, right? <laughs> Um, so this is 10 minutes of training on my machine. Actually, um, yeah, 10 minutes of training on my machine, uh, which is dramatically not enough training. Uh, normally, these things ship with uh, like eight to 10 hours of training, or, or if you're doing something in production, much, 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 much more. Um, if you use a, 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 so one of the cool things about MXNet is that you have access to what the the output of what people make in these other high-level languages. You're not stuck in closure land. So if someone makes a model like this, trains it for 500 hours or whatever, and then releases it, you can then take that MXNet model, load it in Clojure, and you're off to the races. And you can do that. This ships with the Clojure bindings. So this is, a, this is trained for 75 epochs. The top one is trained for two epochs. Um, and it comes from, I believe, the Python or the, the Scala implementation of this network. Um, and it's pretty good, right? Just by asking it what letter comes next, it has figured out that you know, this is how most English words work. It has a couple interesting ideas about what is an English word. I think halfalish is not something I would normally understand. Um, but it's better than the thing on the top, which I think the, the, the thing on the, 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 the two epochs has learned, if you look at the top, uh, how, how capitalized letters work. It knows that you don't capitalize letters in the middle of a word. So that's pretty good. Give it some credit. Okay, so this is all good, but uh, how, does it, how does it all work? Like taking a step back, and how does, how does this work in Clojure, and why did it take so long to get this stuff in Clojure? Because it did, right? In, uh, I think one of the previous questions, or the question for a previous talk was, um, like, the thing, are things slower in Clojure? What's, what's the holdup, right? Why, is, why, is, uh, why are we only doing this now? So the question is, who is the king of the deep learning jungle? Clearly, it is the Python. We have been lagging behind. And to understand why, we have to look again at what we're doing. This is going to take a while, so keep that question in your head. Why, why is Python the winner here? What are we doing? We're doing, we have these large networks. Every single neuron in these networks uh, of which there are very many. Don't, don't forget to notice the ellipsis here. So this is many, many, many nodes vertically. And each one has to be connected to every single neuron in the next layer. And every one, has, every one of those uh, edges between the layers has a value. Every one of the nodes has a value. You have to recalculate these values many, 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 many times. When I say many times, what do I mean? Um, let's take an example or from a, an excellent paper from 2018 that talks about some of the shortcomings of machine learning research these days called, uh, it's a, from Google AI called Winner's Curse. And they said, kind of offhand, <clears throat> talking about something else, large research groups, like uh, funded by Amazon or, or Google or something, have the resources to tune models on 450 GPUs for a week. That is a stunning amount of compute power. That is just, like take a moment and think about that. That's an entire corner of a data center for an entire week. Wait, this is the kind of thing where you have, to, you have to calculate the air conditioning costs, and they're going to be similar to your salary for the entire year. So performance, when you're doing, dealing with this kind of scale, is important. Every single ounce of performance. Why did Python, and also languages like, uh, say, Julia, get performance at that scale that, that the JVM languages did not have? Right? JVM languages, one of, the, one of the benefits of doing closure is that um, we get performance benefits of working on the JVM. Why, didn't, why does that not apply here? Well, 
what are these problems? If you describe a neural network and all these calculations that you have to do where you say, everything in this layer has to be calculated uh, towards every single value in the next layer, and all these edges have values, but we're doing the same operation. If you explain that to a mathematician, they're going to say, oh, you're doing linear algebra. You're doing matrix operations. That's, that's that kind of problem. The problem is shaped like a matrix operation. So the name of the game is tricking the sand, tricking the hardware into doing matrix operations really, really fast. Now, good, because the graphics people have been working on this for a long time. Uh, their problems have been shaped like matrices for much longer than anybody else. So graphics cards are optimized for this kind of, this kind of work, uh, via parallelism and a bunch of other um, specific methods. Um, to get this, this, this speed up driven by the GPU, driven by parallelism, you need to be able to talk to the hardware efficiently. And so what you really need is something uh, at the very low level that can talk to each individual graphics chip extremely efficiently. You're going to need BLAS. The basic linear algebra subprograms standard, this is not one program, but actually an open standard that is a collection of programs, all of which are implemented in either C or Fortran. These are by far the most performant way to make, to, to arrange matrix operations and run them on a GPU. There's, by far, there's no contest. Um, so fa fast matrix operations means you, you, ha you have to use BLAS. These, uh, this standard, or implementations of this standard, have been optimized for literally decades and hand-tuned for decades on specific pieces of hardware. So you, just, you cannot get that from the generic uh, speed up that you get um, uh, with JVM bytecode. So you have to use BLAS. And to talk to BLAS, one of the other things you're going to need is LAPAC, the Linear Algebra Package. It, if BLAS is the very low level, uh, just do you know, matrix uh, multiplication or something, then LAPAC is one level of abstraction up. It's still doing very low level number crunching. It's still written in C or in, or in Fortran. And it's doing things like uh, singular value decomposition, right? So it's still, you know, basic operations, but slightly more abs uh, complex. And it's also fast because of decades of optimization and hand tuning in C and in Fortran. So success in deep learning means access to these libraries, access to BLAST and LAPAC. And Python has had access for a long time. In 1995, they got uh, NumPy. It was actually called Numeric back then. And then SciPy, which is not just access to these libraries, but also a, a wide um, set of libraries and tools to work to do scientific computing on top of those. That's tremendously useful. Uh, and Julia was actually designed, uh, like purpose-built, to talk to Blast in the Pack. So let's contrast this with JVM access. We had F to J that came out in 1999. That's pretty early, but it was uh, a method of talking to BLAST that required auto-translation into JVM bytecode, and it turned out to be three times slower. And if you're talking about uh, 450 GPUs for a week, three times slower is just not going to work. Um, so that's, uh, that's JVM access. We also have direct closure access with Neanderthal and Claytrix. I think a Dragon Durek might be somewhere in the audience. I'm not sure. Um, so this is direct, being able to directly call C libraries. And that's fantastic. That's super helpful. Um, the drawback is, or it's not even a drawback. It's just a natural consequence of what it is. You don't get anything on top. Neanderthal is just access to the, the low-level matrix operations and then a small layer on top. There's all, he also has a separate library, Bayadera, that does some really interesting probabilistic programming. But in terms of high-level deep learning applications, you don't see the same kind of thing that you get in the last two options, right? MXNet, DL4J, these are frameworks. These are high-level frameworks that provide multiple libraries for arranging your problems at, as, uh, as elegantly as possible, right? Describing networks in a high-level language, and then it does the hard grunt work of turning that into matrix operations and then running those operations really, really fast. Let's look at the architecture for that. So this is the MXNet architecture. At the bottom, we have the sand itself, the hardware. And one level up in the yellow layer, we have BLAST and, and also LAPAC and some other things that it has to do to efficiently talk to the hardware. One level up from that in the light green, that's the MXNet abstraction layer, essentially. This is where MXNet provides um, a consistent API across different 
um, high-level languages that says, okay, you're going to need a multi-dimensional array, you're going to need a key value store for internal stuff, um, so on and so on. And then individual languages that MXNet supports are at the top. So C++, Python, R, and Julia, and so on, have APIs to that middle layer so that they can express as elegantly as Enclosure um, their networks very simply. So how does Clojure fit into this? Clojure is not on this list. Well, what is on this list is Scala. If you're not familiar, Scala is, um, people call it the better Java, which it's a, you know, different people like different things. Um, so it's slightly more functional, has some more syntactic sugar and so on, uh, but it's, it compiles to JVM bytecode. And oh no, if, if it compiles to JVM bytecode, we can piggyback on it. You know, that's our, that's our foot in the door. And so through the hard work of Karen Meyer, we have piggybacked on the Scala bindings. And so Scala has first class support, and then Clojure, we, we uh, are not a full-fledged member of the MXNet community yet. So we are reliant on the Scala bindings for the, the stuff that we can do within MXNet itself. So that's the story, right? That's, that's MXNet, that's deep learning, that's what, you, uh, what is now possible in Clojure. Um, now that we know that this is possible, what, what am I asking you to do? I'm just asking you to use it. Um, it's an open, it, like I said, it's not a full-fledged member of MXNet. It is open source, uh, so we need users. We need people to contribute, and that could mean sim is something as simple as running the example and saying it broke. That's, that's open source, right? If you have time to add another example to uh, port functionality from the Scala bindings to the closure bindings, um, to write documentation or an experience report, that's all fantastic. But uh, MXNet needs people to use it, especially in the closure community, if we're going to get uh, full-fledged support. Um, if you don't know what to, what, how to help or how to get involved, uh, Karen Meyer and the rest of the team provides uh, an open source wiki saying like this is what we've done so far and this is the, these are the next steps. Um, there's a, a good number of low hanging fruit issues, so if you have some time and you wanna, wanna play around, it's, it's a good opportunity. Um, yeah, so run an example, file some bugs, contribute whatever you can. That's all I've got, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Dave. That was a super interesting overview. So we have time for some questions. Uh, anyone think about your question and keep it short and precise? Yes. Thanks, Dave. Uh, nice talk. Um, my question would be, can you lose some words about MXNet versus TensorFlow? Or is that not a valid question? Yeah, sure. So um, TensorFlow, I guess, is also for multiple languages, I, I believe. I've never uh, actually used that particular framework. Um, the latest benchmarks I've seen actually show MXNet as faster or more performant than, uh, than TensorFlow. But, I mean, it, it provides the same basic... There's a bunch of these different uh, frameworks, and they provide the same kind of thing, right? Um, you, want to, uh, you want to describe these networks. You want to describe the kind of training you want to do. You want to describe the individual neurons. Yeah, it's, it feels the same in, mo in most of them. Another question over there. So one more, one more word about that. The, the, the speed you get from those, uh, those frameworks is really not about the high-level language. It's important to remember. It's about the low-level implementations. So don't think of it as like a closure versus Python once you're talking about frameworks that have access to those different languages. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, <coughs> I first want to ask, uh, does it already have uh, transfer learning support? or Because I didn't see it in the... the I, I actually did not see that in any of the work that I, I've been looking at. So it's, it's possible. It's, all, it's certainly possible that it's available maybe in, um, in one of the first class languages. I don't believe that it comes out of the box, no. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And another question is, uh, you said we piggyback to Scala, but mm -hmm. why not Java or... Scala? Java doesn't have direct bindings in MXNet. They don't support it. Okay. If you want to do JVM, it's either... I mean, it's Scala for first-class support or Clojure. Uh, or what about Kotlin? Do they have... Okay. No. Not yet. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is to respond. Um, oh, yeah. There is a Java... Uh, directly uh, layer that's 
being worked on. Oh uh, yeah, that's right. That's so right. So once yeah. that layer is in place, then it's conceivable that we can have direct interop with um, Clojure. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. There, right now, the 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 Clojure piggybacking that's going on is due to a lot of uh, very very interesting uh, auto-generated code that Karen wrote. It's it's very very cool stuff. It's it's neat to look at just to see what is possible. Okay, I think we have time for more questions. Yes. <clears throat> Hi. Um, I was wondering where exactly is Plus sitting? Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned it is uh, written in C, mm -hmm. and I was wondering, like, does it offer the um, possibility to write your own compute shaders? Then, if you have to uh, do this stuff, or does it the GPU part yeah. as well? Uh, you know, I'm I'm not sure. I do know it's very possible that MXNet provides the ability to write custom. Um, C commands to, to the blast layer. I don't believe it has the ability to write any lower than that. I, yeah. Thank you. OK. I think that's it. And yeah, thanks again, Dave. Thank and you. the next talk is going to be at 12 o'clock. Okay.